can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Shamit Kemka of Synapse India. And Shamit, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other great episodes of the podcast. And since you are, you've been an EO for many, many years, you've headed up some of the, um, you know, actual city uh, in it for EO and been the president. So there's some other EO podcasts to check out. I've met Zulk, uh, who is in EO Tulsa. I had Oren Klopper, who is in EO uh, South Africa. Um, I had Ethan King, the co-founder of Zeus's Closet in EO Atlanta. And um, just all over the, it's all over the world, all over the country. Um, and David Anderson of Off Madison Avenue, just a few of the, I can go on and on, but all of them are amazing interviews and they talk about their journey and some great uh, business lessons there. So check those out. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a business to launch and run their podcast. We do strategy, accountability, um, and full execution of everything. So, you know, Shemit, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should go to rise25.com. You have questions, email us. And actually that's what, you know, first uh, Shemit and I met through EO and Someone was looking for a recommendation, and I went out searching in my EO network who would be good to refer, and that's how we met. And so hopefully I was able to refer him some business um, if that happens, and, and uh, or maybe in the future regardless. So um, just formally introduce uh, Shamit Kamka is the founder of Synapse India, is a premier IT outsourcing company, and Synapse India provides software development and custom web mobile applications. They have customers throughout the world with most in the USA, UK, Australia, and Canada. Their focus is open source frameworks and e-commerce. Uh, they're also a Microsoft certified gold partner. And over the last 23 plus years, the company successfully delivered over 10,000 projects with such clients as 3M, Steve Madden, IBM, Johnson & Johnson, and of course, EO. And Shamit, thanks for joining me. I'm looking forward to it, uh, Jeremy. You have an incredible journey, and we're going to talk about it because you. We even talked, you know, before we hit record of you um, starting an email service um, back in. I think it was was it ninety three. What year was it? Yeah, ninety four. Ninety four. So we'll go back to you were you were you've always been ahead of your time here. But talk about Synapse India and what you do a little bit first. Sure. So we started this journey, uh, Synapse India, in uh, 1999. Uh, this was born out of uh, fail.com uh, that was uh, called sampati.com. So we tried to replicate one of the uh, you know real estate models that we'd seen in the U.S., uh, successful models in the U.S. in India. But it was far ahead of its time, especially for our country at that point. And uh, it it sort of went belly up within a few months, and then. You know, we had some computers left, some uh, great programmers, and we said, what, what can we do? And I'd, uh, you know, uh, uh, done some websites for companies, corporates in East of India before, uh, before moving to Delhi. So I said, let's, let's give this a try. Let's do websites. Let's do, you know, web-based software. And that's where Synapse India really took off. And, you know, we had a slow uh, organic growth for the first few years. And, uh, but it was fun, you know, it was always cash positive. So we never had to, uh, you know, reach out and borrow any money, which was a great, uh, you know, I, I like to uh, fund myself as much as I can. So that was good. And then, uh, you know, I, I joined EO uh, after crossing that 1 million threshold uh, that EO requires in the year 2006. 
And from there, uh, you know, we just grew very rapidly, very, very quickly, very rapidly. And I think, uh, you know, one if if there's one uh, thing in EO that really helped, uh, that was the MIT program, uh, which was earlier called Birthing of Giants, now called Entrepreneur's Master's Program. So I attended that program for three years and then uh, came back and actually tried to replicate that program in India with the Indian School of Business. Uh, we ran that for three years as well, uh, almost 60 people in each uh, batch. And these these six years were very instrumental in growth. I want to talk about, we'll talk about the evolution of your services for a second, but I want to go back to, because you kind of casually say, we went belly up. And at the time, it's traumatizing, I'm sure. Looking back, you can kind of go, oh, you know, we've grown so much. But at the time, you say we went belly up. You could have just gone out and gotten a job. But it sounded like, I don't know, what was your mindset and thinking around that of how you just bounced and you're like, hey, we'll use our stuff and what we have and we'll start again, right? What were you thinking at the time when it went under, essentially? So I think age is always a huge factor. You know, I was young. I was, uh, what, I think uh, 26 at that time. So it was easy and uh, you know, it was uh, a risk worth taking. So that's one. Uh, second, uh, you know, like you mentioned, I'd been in technology since the year 1994. So I I did have the confidence that we can try and build something afresh and, you know, bootstrap a technology company. So that definitely played in the mind. And uh, w- luckily for us, uh, while we were uh, running the uh, dot com, we still had a lot of inquiries coming our way. So this was nascent days of internet commerce in India. So we had a lot of uh, inquiries coming our way. Uh, well, can you help us with a uh, website? Can you help us with setting up uh, some sort of a commerce online? So things like that. So we knew that there was a demand. We knew that there is a growing set of engineers in India. Uh, so that's something that we can you know, create and take it further. So that's what we did. Is there something that you think about internally to bounce back because even though you're seeing inquiries, you're seeing some positive responses, you know, when you say belly up, how do you bounce back? Maybe today, I mean, and maybe there's still things that happen in the business. How do you kind of just get past those things um, in your own mind? So I think the, uh, you know, reinforcement that uh, in, inherently there is demand, that's one. Second, uh, the uh, the belief in oneself that we can or we can accomplish, you know, something that we are passionate about. about. So I w- I'm I've always been very very passionate about technology. So I knew that we, I can create and I can you know take technology and uh, make a successful business. And third, I think uh, support of family that's very important. And uh, we were young, you know. I had uh, one kid uh, who was you know, six months old. So there wasn't too much uh, to be spent on that front in terms of education or, you know, uh, home didn't demand much at that point. So it was easy. It was easy to try this out. And, you know, luckily it was successful. What did your family say about you going out, starting your own business? Because I think, you know, back then, I don't think entrepreneurship is as sexy as it is now. What was it like then discussions with the family and say, hey, I'm going to go out and start my own business. So we uh, so uh, we, we come from a community in India called Marwaris. Uh, Marwaris are, uh, so they, they are the, they, so most businesses in India till the year, uh, you know, I would say 1980s, 1990s were run by uh, Marwari, uh, uh, you know, families. So it, it's traditionally been a very, business oriented community and uh, i think they would have been very disappointed if i hadn't tried to do something myself so uh, they would rather have me do something and fail rather than you know get a job and not even try doing something myself and i and i and i'll say that uh, i'll say the same thing for my children so two daughters and a son and i would like them to at least give it a shot you know try for a few years if they can't make it then you know, they they get a job, that's fine. But, you know, at least they should try. Let's talk about, because, you know, 
a lot of companies, they don't end up doing what they started doing, right? And even the agency world. So it started off as this company in the web world that went belly up. And then you were getting inquiries for web development. What were some, what was more, if you continue on the evolution of your services, what was next? So the first came simple websites and hosting. So that was the first thing that we started off with. Uh, then came web-based software. So we started developing uh, small software that would uh, pale in comparison to what is achievable now. You know, it, it's probably something that you can get off a SaaS model for a dollar or two, uh, you know, ready, ready to use as of now. So we started with those and then we actually did some very interesting projects. There was uh, actually a company uh, based in the US who had its franchisees in India and they they were using an, uh, if I can call it a ERP, it, their backend system was on Clipper and DBase. And uh, they wanted to build a web-based front end which would connect to that for their dealers. And we were successful in creating a module which would extract data out of the DBase and present it on the web. So that was very, uh, it was quite ahead of its time. And, you know, so we we did a lot of, you know, there's an Indian word. It's a very common word in India, especially in North India called Jugaad. I don't know if you've heard of that before. So, uh, you know, Jugaad is, and it's really difficult to really explain. It's like uh, when you see somebody who's taken a diesel generator that generates electricity and put it in front of a, uh, in front of three wheels and made a car out of it. So that in the evening it'll give him electricity and the day it'll help him ride to the city. That's that's what is Jugaad. And so Indians are very good at Jugaad, and Indians are typically uh, you know born entrepreneurs the way I I I'd like to see it. So you know that allowed us to find solutions where none existed. So at that point in 1999, 2000, 2001, these uh, solutions for connecting your backend to the uh, you know web didn't really exist in India. So we were able to, you know, do that, do that jugad and come up with those solutions. So that was fun. It, it was really exciting uh, at that point. And then, what about is the IT outsourcing? So IT outsourcing. Uh, so you know, slowly, slowly and steadily, we started moving. Uh, you know, between uh, technology, between solutions that we offered. So you know, going from web to mobile applications. So the first EO application was built by me in the year uh, 2007 or 2008, 2008, I think. Uh, so, you know, I, at that point, I was on the EO uh, technology committee and, you know, we used to keep talking about how difficult it is to uh, access the database, to search for members and such. And, you know, there was obviously no mobile app at that point. So I took on myself to uh, hire a mobile application developer, uh, got him to, you know, connect to the API on the uh, EO website and develop this app, which is still, it's still functional even now. If you search for EO Global, you'll find it. And uh, so that was the first mobile application project that we ever did. And since it was successful and since people started using it, we said, hey, why, why don't we get into mobile development as well? And that's where the mobile uh, division took off. And we now have about 35 people just doing mobile applications. You know, so It's I all been evolving organically. Um. I talked about some of the clients you've had, you know, in the U.S. and across the world, 3M, IBM, Microsoft, Audi, PayPal, Steve Madden. Um, there's different stigmas around using Indian, you know, companies, based companies, right? So I'd love for you to talk about that. How do you overcome that? We are talking before we hit record is sometimes people view it as cheap labor. And it is, it's inexpensive, no doubt. I mean, it is less expensive than many other countries, but the way I would set us set us apart is uh, one, uh, a lot of people don't understand that we actually ha have probably one of the better spoken and written English uh, in, in the world. So, you know, we probably uh, speak better English or, uh, you know, more, or more, more uh, sort of fluent English than the English themselves at this point. I don't know if you've heard, you know, English speak nowadays, the British speak nowadays. So that's that's one. And second, uh, you know, the talent, the uh, ability or the availability of talent in India is huge. It's immense. Uh, you know, we are a country of 140 million people. And, 
I, I would say there would be at least a million great engineers in the country. So we have immense talent. And to waste it away by not exploring uh, the software industry uh, would have been uh, a shame. So I'm glad that you know the earlier um, entrepreneurs in India 30, 35 years back started uh, software as an industry in India, and you know, we, we, we contribute to it. Uh, I think uh, where we come in is just the ability to scale, which I don't think any other country has in terms of manpower in, in the technology field. Uh, so that's where we excel. And, you know, fast learning, uh, fast adapting. Jugar, like I mentioned, is a huge talent uh, for Indians. So that really sets us apart. And uh, typically, uh, the 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 downside is that we don't know how to say no. Uh, you know, that's a huge challenge for most Indians. So you, even in our company, when we onboard people, we have to teach them uh, it's all right to say no, uh, you know, when you can't do something. So, yeah. Talk about objections. So when you're initiating conversation with a U.S.-based company, what are some of the objections that you get? So I think the biggest uh, uh, downside is the time zone. Uh, so the time zone is always a, uh, you know, something that people try and compare us to uh, Mexico or uh, Colombia or even Philippines uh, to that matter. Uh, but luckily for us, the way I see it is uh, we, we sort of overlap three and a half to four hours uh, with the East Coast and a couple of hours uh, with the West Coast on the other side of the day. Uh, so that allows us to be uh, in sufficient communication with our customers, understand, you know, uh, or, or deliberate on a project uh, in a collaborative way, and then work ourselves. So, you know, software is not something that necessarily needs collaboration at all times. You know, there's uh, to and fro, but that can be achieved, and then a person can sit and do the work themselves after that. Uh, so I think we have that advantage where we have a few hours of overlap and we make the best of it. But that is something that most people uh, worry about when outsourcing. And the second is communication. Like I mentioned, most people don't realize that India is, uh, mo most people in India, uh, English is almost their first language because they are uh, educated in it. So most of our education is in English. So, you know, you'll rarely find uh, engineers that don't know how to communicate in English, uh, uh, software engineers, yeah. Any other objections you get? business-wise or culture-wise? Not really. I think culturally, we are very, very adaptable people. So I don't think we get any uh, objections culturally. But uh, business-wise, uh, maybe for the initial years that we started off, uh, there was always a stigma to uh, can we send money abroad? Would it be safe? Uh, you know, Will the work actually get delivered? Uh, so that was always a question. But as you build... Uh, you know, the repository of um, sort of uh, portfolio as you create that, uh, you know, will in the market, then it, I think those questions sort of disappear. Yeah, it's a trust thing. Once they understand yeah. you're reputable. I mean, that goes with across any country, culture, you know, it's it's always a trust thing. Is this company trustworthy and can deliver what they say they can deliver? Um Correct. I want to talk about, you know, this is a very people centric business. So I love to talk about recruiting and hiring and some of the things you found as best practices or big mistakes as far as recruiting and hiring goes. So recruiting and hiring has always been the toughest thing in our industry. You know, since day one, uh, attrition has always plagued this industry. Uh, it's And it's primarily because we've grown really fast. Uh, particularly in India, uh, especially in the last 15 years and uh, of late, the last uh, four or five years between COVID and after COVID. Uh, so th that's always been a huge challenge. I think for me, the uh, one game changer was this program in the MIT, uh, in the MIT batch where they had uh, top grading. So that really helped us uh, improve our um, recruiting processes, create sort of uh, process oriented recruitment rather than just subjective so it became very objective compared to a whole lot of subjectivity so that really helped by the uh, way i'll just mention XR, really quickly shamit i had the uh 
the CEO of Top Grading, uh, Chris Marcel, on the podcast. You can check out that episode. And that's what their book is about. That's what they do is talk about how do you hire and attract and retain A-list A players. So, okay. so keep so going. We had uh, Brad Smart uh, in our class uh, teaching us uh, about top grading. So that was wonderful, you know, from the horse's mouth. So that was really wonderful. And I think that really helped. And then along with that, you know, of course, we adapted. You know, the forum in EO really helps because you learn from best practices of your peers of different other industries and verticals. Uh, so that really helped in terms of understanding what other companies are doing to retain best talent and, you know, even recruit best talent. So what has worked for you with from a retention standpoint? As of, as of now, right now, I mean, if you ask me, uh, it's been a huge challenge. After COVID, uh, you know, everything has just gone topsy-turvy because, you know, people have, left en masse uh, IT companies, they've, you know, we've had uh, the IT industry is just going through a huge lot of turmoil. So uh, what had worked in the past is definitely not working <laughs> right now. Uh, but I think it's, it's a, it's a balance. It, it you know, it's going to come back, you know, there will be uh, some sort of sanity to this uh, soon enough. Um, but, uh, you know, it has been very, very challenging in the last year and a half. Uh, we We lost a lot of people who'd been with us for, 15, 20 years, in fact. Uh, so that was a huge challenge that we had to overcome. So we had to strengthen our processes more. We had to be less people dependent. Uh, so that was, you know, good learning. Uh, and, you know, I think we are changing how we work to some extent based on that. How do you explain that? Because it's happening across many industries. But but how do you explain, you know, someone's been with a company for 15 years. You know, that that's a long time. It is. It is indeed. And, you know, yeah, it's interesting because I, I recently met a uh, huge uh, MNC uh, who, who, who's, in, who's mostly into manufacturing in India. And uh, they, for them, uh, they, their timeline for most employees is five to seven years. They literally just hire with a mindset that the employee is going to be there for five to seven years and give the best uh, in those years. And then they're not looking for something longer term than that. Whereas I, I guess I'm a little old fashioned that way. Uh, I like to, uh, you know, grow with the employees. I like to grow, you know, the business around them. Uh, so that has been uh, particularly challenging due to COVID and uh, the attrition that came after COVID. Uh, but I think uh, I would like to stick to that. I, I wouldn't want to change that entirely. Uh, although we have moved a lot of our processes, like, you know, things that we can for example, using chat GPT for a few of our, uh, you know, um, uh, copywriting and portfolio management and things like that. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, objective uh, HR processes versus uh, which uh, things that were very subjective in the past. So we, we've tried to accommodate with time and, you know, try and be lean and mean when it comes to employees primarily because it's tough to really recruit at this point. What has worked in the past? Sure, because, you know, retaining staff members for 20 years is pretty darn good, right? So what has worked? You, you've asked me that question again, so I'm going <laughs> to come out with the... I know uh, there's something. <laughs> in there. So this... Uh, You're uh, being we, modest. We, we were, you know, don't be modest with No, me. we were innovating. We were trying to find uh, things uh, or solutions that uh, were a little different than what we had seen in the industry. So for example... Uh, and I'll give you two examples. We have something called loyalty leaves and loyalty bonus. Now, uh, what we came up with is that uh, for each year that the employee had been with us, we would give them an additional day uh, apart from the mandatory statutory needs. Uh, uh, so, so at the end of 10 years, an employee would get 10 extra days off in a year. So that was one. Uh, along with that, we had a lot of incentives to take a, a, a holiday, a paid holiday with uh, additional incentive for your anniversary, for your birthday, for for uh, uh, kids uh, when they were born. So, you know, we would incentivize people to take off and uh, also send them on holidays together and things like that. So that really worked initially. Uh, that changed during COVID, I think, but at least till COVID, it worked brilliantly. Uh, then the loyalty bonus is something that we came up with 
way back in 2005, where we said, for each year that you had been with the business, uh, we, we would pay an extra amount per month. So uh, if, you, if you'd been for longer, you, so it, it, it became quite a considerable amount. And we were paying that out uh, each month to employees who'd been with us for 15, 20 years. So uh, that added like a nice uh, you know, bonus packet and at, at the end of each month instead of the end of the year and things like that. So that really helped. Uh, we also came up with the industry first, like you know, complete medical insurance, which is which is not typical in India. Uh, you know, a lot of lot of things like that. You know, innovative things like that. I love it. Thank you. I knew it was in you. I knew you have it. Uh, so I appreciate <laughs> you sharing that. Um, you know, from the standpoint of uh, companies you've worked with, right? You worked some, with some incredible companies, like I mentioned, three M, IBM, Steve Madden. Do you remember the first one that you were especially proud of? Like, wow, we made it from a standpoint of we're really attracting some amazing companies. And I think, uh, for, so we, we worked with some large companies before, but I think the one that I'm definitely the most proud of is EO. You know, having worked with EO, uh, you, you know, being a member of you, understanding the, uh, you know, the the a sense of the organization, organization, and then, you know, we ran maintain the uh, original website since 2010. To uh, even now, we we do some maintenance work for you. So that's definitely been something that we are very proud of, and that logo goes up uh, first and foremost with you know any client logo that we put up. Love it. And I was, you know, I was reading an email um, from you the other day, and in the um, signature area, there's a quote from Steve Madden in there. Correct. Um, the team's very professional. I would 100% recommend it to anyone that looks for a solid partnership for their e-commerce projects or mobile apps. What kind of work did you do with Steve Madden? So we still run and maintain a lot of their e-commerce portals, and we we work with their backend as well. So uh, they have an ERP system uh, that we integrate and we run uh, with the Shopify store. So we work with the Australia team, we work with the uh, South Africa team, we work with the um, uh, Middle East now. We just recently completed the project for Middle East. Uh, they, they partnered with a third party. So the way that Middle East is structured is that they, they need to have a local partner there. So they partnered with somebody locally there and we just completed the site for them as well uh, on Shopify. Let's you worked with, and um, if you're watching the video, you can see right now I'm on the synapseindia.com website. So if you want to learn more about what they do, what they're working on, you can go to synapseindia.com. And there's also, you know, a case study page where they kind of walk through some of the things that they've done. But I want to talk about, um, one of the ones you helped was an oncology lab. Correct. What'd you do with them? See, oncology lab is uh, also incidentally owned by a EO member. And uh, so they reached out to us right uh, when COVID had, uh, I think six months into COVID. And the government of India had mandated certain reporting uh, through their COVID site. So you you had to run through the COVID uh, uh, website to uh, uh, verify the uh, proximity alerts and things like that. And they so they had these two lab machines uh, which didn't talk to each other, two completely different manufacturer-based machines. And they needed to consolidate, it, consolidate these reports and run it through the API of the government website. Now, that entire process was taking them uh, several days at a time uh, to do. So we were able to create a robotic uh, process. Uh, so we used RPA. A unipath, uh, you know, as the backend, and we were able to automate that entire process of getting the reports from both the uh, lab machines, consolidating it, checking it against the uh, government, uh, you know, COVID uh, website, and then producing the uh, PDF that would go out to the uh, end consumer. Shopify seems like a popular request from you and the company. Um, you also worked with. Um, pure cosmetics, hundred percent pure. Yeah, what did you do with them? 
so we run and maintain the Shopify sites as well. Uh, so we do a uh, little bit of e-commerce marketing for them. We, uh, you know, do coding uh, in terms of the apps that they have on the Shopify website. Uh, we do some um, uh, backend uh, maintenance. We do a lot of creatives for them. Uh, so they, they, they basically are D2C, direct-to-consumer brand. So we do a lot of their, uh, you know, uh, social media, their uh, branding, things like that. What have you seen as mistakes people make? You, you've obviously, I mentioned, over 10,000 projects. What do mistakes people make with their Shopify or e-commerce site? I guess the uh, one mistake that I see a lot of people uh, making is trying to build something custom uh, when there are uh, modules or ready-made software which is available. Uh, so the advantage of ready-made and, uh, you know, especially if it is by Shopify themselves, if there are modules that are available, then they are a little more faster, more efficient. And, you know, it, you don't have to go through the uh, rigmarole of any kind of testing and things like that. So I would always encourage people to pick and choose from what is available and plug and play rather than build custom apps. But every once in a while, we have to, we have to build something custom because, the checkout requires it or, you know, some sort of functionality that is not available on Shopify or plugins. So what kind of, what are your favorite Shopify plugins? Um, <laughs> Do any come I to mind? probably won't be able to answer that question, but, you know, I know that uh, we've built a few plugins like loyalty. Uh, so we've created loyalty plugins ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, we, uh, you know, freely distribute to our customers. So when they uh, have, have us develop a Shopify site, we give that free of cost. Uh, and then there's a couple of other uh, checkout integrations with uh, 3PL, uh, you know, third-party logistics that we uh, built uh, for ourselves. So most of the custom plugins, um, you would say, you don't make them readily available on the Shopify app. You know, so people can't get them. They can't, you know, because a lot of them, you know, there's a subscription, obviously. But if someone hires you, then you will actually deploy the the custom ones that you've built. Uh, so the custom ones that we built are very uh, niche. And that's the reason why we haven't put it up on the store. Uh, but uh, more often than not, uh, customers also come to us for their own requirement, which is then their intellectual property. So we will build that app and we'll hand it over to them and then we don't have access to those uh, custom builds. That makes sense. Um, speaking of apps, um, Sonify. So what, Sonify what was doing? very interesting. So Sonify was an interesting uh, 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 client. So Sonify initially had come to us to build an app for uh, hotels and you know they were they were using the app for guest rooms where you could control your TV and control other amenities using the app. And then uh, they later pivoted to health. So if you search for Sonify Health app, you'll find it where it's now deployed in about 135,000 rooms across hospitals across the US. And uh, the, the app actually allows uh, pretty much maintaining uh, all your technology in the room in terms of the television, you know, calling for any kind of support or, you know, ordering meals, uh, you know, your schedules in terms of medicines and other uh, activities. So things like that. Um, you know, Shimon, I have one last question. Uh, before I ask it, I just want to point people to check out your website and to learn more. You can go to synapseindia.com to learn more about what they're working on there. And the last question I have is about leadership. You know, you lead a pretty large team, and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Um, what's worked for you as far as leadership? What maybe mistakes should other people avoid as they grow a larger team uh, from leadership perspective? So most of my learning has been from other peers, right? I mean, whether it be in EO or other organizations that I've interacted with. So I've had, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of learning that I've got from them and 
I can just share some of those, uh, you know, in, in the brief time that we have. So uh, one thing that I know uh, really helped us is that we would relook at our processes, our systems, our technology every five years. So that really helped because as we grow as an organization from five to 10, 10 to 50, 50 to 100, things change and, you know, we, we need to relook at technologies and the backends that we're using. So that is something that we did very diligently every five years. Uh, and that really helped, especially when uh, COVID hit India. Uh, most of our uh, technology, most of our servers were online on the cloud. So we were able to escape, you know, doing too much of uh, micromanagement at that time. So uh, that's one. Apart from that, I would say uh, having uh, outsourced a lot of our activities such as uh, you know, so we before COVID, we had uh, lunch catered uh, in the office for everyone. So we, we would outsource anything that was not inherent to our business. So anything that wasn't really, you know, actual activity for our business, we would outsource. So that's something that I strongly, strongly believe in that let's not try and get into every kind of activity in our business. And uh, third is, uh, you know, as, as a policy, we uh, at least still till COVID, and now again, uh, we would have one retreat each year where we would entire, invite the entire office. So everyone was invited, and a couple of them was even with the families uh, and different places each time. You know, we'd do driving distances from Delhi, like two hours, three hours, four hours away from Delhi, uh, where we would hire big buses and cars and, you know, just take the uh, employees out for a good time and, you know, do some activities there, fun activities, you know, sports things like that. So that's really worked well for us. First of all, I wanted to the first one to thank you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, expertise, and journey. Uh, everyone should check out synapseindia.com. And thanks again. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.